sermon finish, you're dismissed. I don't know how I could add to that. Hold on. Some of you in the back trying to get up and leave. I thought I was serious. No, I'm just kidding. Got to keep your eye on them folks back here in that back corner. Well, I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know if there's somebody here that's on the bubble. I don't know if there's somebody here that thinks in their mind it's certainly your right to think whatever it is you want to think. But I know today we're going to preach the Bible. And if you got any questions, I'm echoing. If you got any questions, this would be a wonderful time to walk through the Scripture with me this morning. This is not a time that, um, that we're going to be here to, um, to say this is how you ought to believe and, or if you don't believe like we do and this, that, and other. But what I want you to do is take an honest look at what the Scripture has to say about it. So turn with me, if you will, to Genesis <clears throat> chapter 1. I'm so sorry. Children's Church. We're just going to keep that between ourselves, okay? That's the inside joke over here on this corner. Children's Church. All the all the guys going to Children's Church, uh, you are welcome to go. Good looking bunch. All right. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to start here, but we're just we're going to journey through the scriptures, and uh, we're going to think biblically about life, and um, not here to state my opinion. I could I could uh, I could rave. Trust me, you don't know how strongly I feel about this issue. Uh, I'm I am on the extreme side of of pro life. I'm very pro life. I'm as Pro-life as a person could be, I think. But um, I want to know what the Bible says. And I know what it says. And I want to make sure that you know what it says. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 through 31. Let's just look at that as we begin. Genesis chapter 1 beginning with verse 26. And God said... Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So God said, and he created life. I thought what... Janet had what the video said. I think it all lines up. The Lord had it all in mind when he planned this. This morning we're going to start a new series called Putting the Pieces Together. And over the next several weeks we're going to be looking, uh, even though next week is Baptist Men's Day, and let me, let me just add, men, if, if you could come out for choir practice Wednesday, we, we need to have a men's choir. And uh, so we need to have plenty of you fellers, even the ones who don't normally come out. Everybody here wants to hear you sing. So you come out Wednesday for choir practice, okay? Uh, but we're going to be doing that next week. Got some things planned for that. But here's the thing. I care deeply about what you think about. And I, and I would assume that you uh, consider, at least consider, uh, what I might think about. But in the end, does that really matter? Does it matter what, how you feel about something or how I feel about something? What matters most is what God says about it, right? right? And so we look in the Bible, and in the Bible we form our belief system. What we believe, there may be things in our life this morning that we believe uh, because our mama taught us or our grandma taught us, but even in those things, as good as they are most of the time, even in those things, you've got to line them up with Scripture. And so... What the Bible says. Do we think biblically? And I believe this series will help us know not only what we believe, but why we believe it. 
I believe that every one of us here this morning who claims to be a disciple, a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, ought to be able to defend their faith. You ought to be able to tell somebody why you're a Christian. Well, it's just, it just seemed like the right thing to do. That ain't going to cut it. Uh, why do you believe that abortion is wrong? It just is. I've, I've always thought. I, my daddy taught me it was wrong. My, my grandma said it was wrong. That don't cut it. You've got to be able to tell somebody why you feel the way you feel if you want to convince them, if you want to be a witness, if you want to change somebody else's mind or opinion or their heart. And certainly the Holy Spirit does that. So this is why this is important. Do we think biblically? And we're going to be looking at several different things, things that has to do with our own church, with our own community, with our own country, and mainly with ourselves. Things that deal with ourselves. So this morning, obviously, we're looking at the sanctity of human life. And I believe that this is one of the most important issues of our day. Whether or not you think someone is a person or not, whether or not human life is important to you, I believe is the most important issue of the day because I believe from it and out of that opinion you form most of your other opinions. You see, I will look at you in a certain way based on what I think about mankind. Do I think God made trash? Then if so, I may look at you as trash. If, uh, if, do I think that uh, God messed up and made errors when He created human life? Well, if I think that way, then I'm going to look at you and think, boy, he really messed up on that one. You know? And, 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 and then, or if I think, you know, this way or the other, depending upon what I think about life, if I believe that I have the right to end a life, then I might look at you one day and think, hmm, this preacher's going postal. I'm going to end your life. I don't have that right. I don't have that authority. Right? Because God is the creator of life. And so I believe this uh, subject is so important. We live in a world today to where society, the world, and Satan, the enemy, has tried to take life and so devalue it that we could look at someone and think, hmm, I'm better than they are. Or... They do not deserve to live. They do not deserve to have the same kind of life that I have. And there's folks like that today. In fact, our, our current government is actively working to replace our Judeo-Christian belief system. They're working hard to change things. And you and I, we look around and we see this. And the only way to counter this, we can jump up and down and we can scream and we can holler. We can get mad, we can get upset. But there's only one thing that's going to counter this, and that's the people of God getting serious about the Word of God. And so as we walk through Scripture, we begin today in Genesis. I just read a couple verses, but we're going to, we're going to do a lot of Scripture. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you every Scripture reference, but I'm going to tell you now, I've already got it written down. So you can go ahead and turn, and I'll be talking about it long enough for you to get there, but I just want you to have the Scripture reference if you want to write it down. Or turn there, that's fine. But I'm not going to wait on you. If you're not there, I'm going to keep trucking. Okay? All right. So as we walk through the Scripture, our journey begins in Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says, In the beginning, God created everything there is that is in existence today, God created it. God created it. In the beginning, God created And as we look over this chapter, I want you to see that each and every day, in, in the count of... Um, of, of creation, the Bible says at the end of every day, God looked at it and said, that's good. I mean, that's good. I did a good job. That's, that's really, really good. But what I want you to do is look in verse 31. Because after He formed man, God said, this is very good. It is the only thing that He said, this is very good. In other words, the mountains are good. The ocean is good. The creeks, the rivers, the valleys, everything that God created is good. But when He formed man, He said, that is very good. That's important. All of creation culminated with the making of man. Man was the reason for the creation. Man is why God created the heavens and the earth. And only after man 
did God say this is very good? That word very comes from a phrase, Madaya, meaning exceedingly. This is exceedingly good. So when God created man, He said, this is very good. It's really exceedingly good. In other words, you and I were not an accident. <coughs> you and I are not an accident. We're, we're not a people of a random chance. The video said that so after so many weeks in the womb, things begin to uh, develop. When that DNA is created, it's, it's already saying what color hair. Too bad it don't say that it's going to stay that way. But it says what color eyes. And, and I thought in the video it was very interesting that so, so young the, the baby decides uh, or knows it's going to be left-handed or right-handed. And it'll favor that thumb. It's an amazing concept. God created this. It's not something that man come up with. We are a people of destiny and purpose. Now if you look in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 and look at how man was made. The Bible says the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. The very breath that you and I have that God gave us is indeed a gift. The breath. He breathed life into man. And today, I believe with all my heart that if God would withdraw Himself from me, I would stop breathing. He's the sustainer of life. Everything rotates around Him. And this is where the biblical worldview comes into play. This is where it begins. That God is the creator of life and every life has purpose and meaning. So in life, you're either going to have a secular worldview. Worldview. In other words, you're going to look at things and think, well, you know what? There's enough people in this country who believe this way, so I'm going to believe this way because it must be right because there's enough people. Or you're going to say, no, I'm going to have a biblical worldview. I'm going to believe the world or I'm, I'm going to believe God. One of the two. Within our culture and society, the Bible uh, the, or the biblical understanding is rejected probably more than any other Reference to the unborn. What is the scripture teaching about the unborn? Well, let's find out. In Genesis chapter 16, we read about a woman by the name of Hagar and her unborn son. Hagar was the mistress to the Sarah before Sarah became the mother of Isaac. And the promise had been given to Abraham. Many of you know this story. But the promise had been given to Abraham that he would have a son. And years went by and Sarah never became pregnant. So one day, Sarah had this idea. This is a crazy idea. But because Hagar was part of the family, quote unquote, uh, uh, she said, Abraham, why don't you go have a youngin with Hagar? And so you know the story, how it goes. They had that youngin, and, and as soon as she got pregnant, Sarah got mad at her. He, she was jealous of her. She started mistreating her. And then the Bible tells us uh, in Genesis chapter 16, that Hagar runs away and falls under a bush. And in, verse, and in verse 11, God speaks to Hagar about her unborn child. Let me say here that you either have a born child or an unborn child. But either way, it's a child. Okay? Verse 11, the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. He shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. God knew everything about this child before he was born. I mean, this is pretty detailed. You know, God could say this about some of y'all, I believe. He's a wild child, you know. I know my mama thought, thought that about me and, and, until I got uh, reformed. But God knew everything about this child. He knew, he even knew the history behind Ishmael. Now turn to Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. Here, Rebecca, Isaac's wife, becomes pregnant. And she is concerned because of the strong movement within her. Now ladies, y'all would be the only one here today that could tell us how that feels. I remember T.C. saying, uh, put your hand here. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, every time he'd kick, you know. But, but for, for, the, for the mother, I'm sure there's just, uh, oh, 
there's a life inside you. And as fellows, all we could do is, <laughs> it kicked. <laughs> you know, maybe it's going to be an NFL kicker, yeah. Probably not. So in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, Rebecca is concerned because all this movement. Has anybody here had twins? Do we have twins here? Anybody? Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Well, you can't ask. But I don't know what it'd be like. Boy, could you imagine triplets? What about that one lady that had, what, seven of them or five of them, six of them? I don't know. Lord, I'd have to leave the room after about three or four. <laughs> Whew, that'd wear you out. Two nations, the verse 23, Genesis chapter 25 says this. Rebecca wanted to know, and God said to her, two nations are in your womb. Think about how important this is. Think about what this implies. God said to Rebecca, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other. And the older will serve the younger. Think about what that means. That is so specific. That is right from the get-go, complete backwards than the way it should be. Usually the younger would serve the older. The oldest son always had it. But even then, God knew before these boys were born, God knew exactly what was going to happen. And He knew their mentality. God knew everything about these boys. And I'll tell you something. The Lord knows the unborn as He does the born. Now go with me to Exodus chapter 21. In Exodus chapter 20, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And then in chapter 21, God gives case law. So he's making it very, very specific. And so if we ever got to the point in our life where we said, well, you know, I don't know that the Bible really speaks about this issue. I think we've already proved that to be false. But look in Exodus chapter 20, uh, or 21, I'm sorry. God gives case law here. In these cases, the Lord is saying that the punishment must be equal to the crime. Now, this is the law. The Bible tells us that it should be no more harsh nor too lenient, but equal. And in this passage of Scripture... We have a situation where two men were fighting and they hit a pregnant woman who as a result gives birth prematurely. Verse 22 says this, chapter 21, verse 22. If men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined, whatever, this is paraphrase, whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. Verse 23. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. That right there tells you that God puts as much value on the unborn child as He does a grown adult. For that unborn child that's in the belly, God places just as much value on that as He would any one of us. Because he says it right there. God does not distinguish it with age. The punishment is the same. Now go with me to Judges chapter 13. We're just journeying through scripture here. Uh, in, in Judges chapter 13 verses 3 through 5. This is the birth of Samson. Everybody knows who Samson is. God speaks to the wife of a man by the name of Manoah about a child she will conceive. Verse 3. Judges chapter 13, verse 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. She hasn't even conceived yet. You shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. I want you to just, just take the time and just read through these scriptures and realize what it's uh, implying here. Before this baby was even conceived, God said this is going to be the boy that's going to begin the deliverance of Israel. 
Now, if that's not specific enough for you, then I don't know what could be. Here again, God knew all about Samson. Knew, knew the strength he was going to have, and he knew the weaknesses he was going to have. Just like he knows about us. A child with a purpose and a promise. And I look at that child, and I look at all of our children, and I think about our kids across the street, and I think everyone has a purpose and a promise and has a reason to be here. Now go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. David has had an affair with Bathsheba. Bummer for David. But a child was conceived. And as judgment, the child fell sick and was going to die. So in response, this is what David did. David covered him in sackcloth. And he fasted while pleading with the Lord on his behalf. And during this time, while David was pleading for this child's life, the child passed away. And David's attendants wondered how would they possibly tell David. So upon hearing of the child's death, this is what David did. He stopped what he was doing. The Bible tells us that he washed his face and he began to eat. I mean, who does that? Who has this horrific? You've known folks that has had perhaps a, a miscarriage or something. I've known some people in my life and, and, or a child to pass away. And uh, this is not how they reacted. But here's the, here's the good news. Listen. David's advisors, they were perplexed and they asked David, how could they possibly, how could he possibly act like this? This is what he says in verse 23. He is now dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? No. I will go to him. Amen? Amen. I will go to him. He will not come back to where I'm at. He is not going to return to me, but I'm going to him. David knew where his son was at. Amen? Amen. There are only two things in this life that's eternal. And that's God's Word and God's people. If you're a child of God this morning, you are eternal. And God's Word and God's people are eternal. One of the truths that this message reveals is that God knows the unborn. He knows them. He knows them by name. He created them. They are eternal. God does not look at the unborn any different than He does the born. Therefore, children who do pass, they will be reunited with their parents again one day in heaven. And I believe this is as early, as early as conception. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that life begins at conception as soon as that DNA is done. In the book of Job, we read that there was no one uh, like this man. Uh, Job was incredibly blessed. We know the story of Job. How he, he, was, a, he was a rich fellow. I mean, he had all sorts of things. I mean, he had John Deere's. He had, he had the whole nine yards. I mean, he had all the cattle. He had a brand new Chevy, Ford, and Dodge. Now there, get mad at me over that one. <laughs> he had three brand new trucks. Somebody says, well, why didn't he have a Toyota? <laughs> well, I can't help you there. But he had it all. And we read in his life, and we know the story, how he lost it all. But I want you to remember what the Bible says about Job. The Bible tells us that at, at the end, Job was blessed double of everything he had. It wasn't. Now, now he, had, he had twice as many camels, twice as many donkeys, twi twice as many cattle, twice as many sheep. But how many kids did he have? He only wound up with the same he started with. He wound up with seven kids. Uh, seven sons, excuse me, seven sons and three daughters. But you know, they were double because he had seven sons and three daughters in heaven. I just, I just saw this this week. I never thought of it that way. The Bible says that he had double of everything he had. And God blessed him with another seven sons and three daughters. And he already had that up in heaven, so that is double. It's incredible. See, God's amazing, ain't he? 
He's awesome. So let's continue. I know you want to sit down on the bench there. It looks pretty, but let's keep walking. Let's go to Psalms chapter 139. Probably no better place in the Bible. Probably no more scripture that's been read about life than, than Psalms 139. So uh, this is a wonderful place. Uh, David, the Holy Spirit inspired David to write this. Verses 13 through uh, 16, David says this, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my un formed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. If there's any doubt beyond what the, the Bible says, that it's just your unbelief. Okay? He loves you. Our Heavenly Father crafted you just the way you are. Every one of us here this morning. We are exactly the way God wanted us to be. He knows our temperate he knows our personality. He knows our body structure. The Bible even says He even knows how many hairs are on your head. I said it right. Hallelujah. I usually say it backwards. But I said it right this morning. All right. God loves us so much that He even allowed His Son to be crucified for us. That's how much He loves us. It's amazing. God made you just the way he wanted you to be. You are a person of destiny and purpose. You are. There's a lot of people who tries to blow that out of proportion and all that. And, and I don't want to seem like some televangelist up here. You have a destiny and you have a purpose. But the fact of the matter is you do. Every one of us has a purpose and a destiny. God made you just the way he wanted you to be. Every child that's in the womb has a purpose and is loved by the Heavenly Father. Therefore, we should never, we should never consider abortion as an option because a child would be inconvenient. The truth is that what we sometimes consider a crisis, God turns into a blessing. That's, mm. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. We're almost there. Here God tells the prophet, in verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. It is clear in this passage of Scripture that God knew Jeremiah before he was even born. Countless times. Time after time after time, God knew exactly what these people were going to do before they were even born or even conceived. And then look in Luke chapter 1. What we just finished celebrating... Christmas, the birth of Jesus. We've looked at, looked at that. All of Luke chapter 1 and 2, uh, such a beautiful story. But we know that a young virgin by the name of Mary is visited by an angel, Gabriel, and she, told, she is told that she would have a child, even though she was a virgin. And she was to name him Jesus. And afterwards, uh, the point I want to make in this scripture is afterwards she went to see her cousin Elizabeth. And something happened. What happened? John, what, what did John do? Jumped. He jumped. And he was, she, Elizabeth was six months pregnant. John leapt inside Elizabeth. In the presence, in the presence of Emmanuel. God with us, Jesus. You know why? Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the difference, filled with the Holy Spirit. Chances are Jesus was only a few weeks old in Mary's be in belly. You see, this walk through Scripture, I, I hope, has given us an understanding that from the very beginning until the completion, God knows that unborn child, that it is a child. It's not a fetus. It's not a mass. It is a child from the very beginning. And I hope that if there was any doubt in your mind, and even if there still is, my prayer is that you'll go back and you'll look at these scriptures and you'll let the Holy Spirit speak to you. 
God knows the unborn and calls them by name. He created them for a purpose. They are people of purpose from the moment of conception. God is the God of life and He wants us to choose life over death. So our calling, what you and I are to do, is we are to trust God in every stage of life. From beginning to end. No matter how young and no matter how old, we are to trust God. Just trust God. We did not create life, so we don't have the right to play God and end life. Or, nor do we have the right to say, this life has value and this life no longer is vital. We are to stand boldly for life at every stage of the game. It's our job to stand boldly for those who cannot stand for themselves. Listen, the Bible says these six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto Him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 31 verse 8 that we should speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves for the rights of all who are destitute. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 11 says that we are to rescue those being led away to death. We are to hold back those staggering toward the slaughter. In other words, we ought to care about people. Period. And then the final scripture, Psalms chapter 82, 82 verses 3 and 4 says this, Defend the cause of the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. See, this is our part in today's message. Decide what view you're going to have. You need to decide how, what you think and how you view life. Is it going to be a secular worldview? Is it going to be a scriptural or a biblical worldview? Develop with your brothers and sisters the church strategies and support life in every place you can. Support those who cannot defend themselves. And then finally, we can demonstrate our support. We can tell others how we feel because it's important. Now I want to end this way. I talked to Brother Roger Newton uh, this past week because I've known Roger for a while. He's the director of the Ash Pregnancy Care Center. And I remember years ago, uh, back in 2008, when it first came, when a lady walked into my office when I was director of missions, and she said, we need a pregnancy center in, in Avery County. I said, a, a, a what? <laughs> Here I had been a pastor, and, and I, I knew them, but, but I didn't really know what they did. I, I knew they existed. I knew they was a good thing, but I knew nothing about them. And so we started on this journey, and I met Roger. We met several other folks from, uh, from different um, pregnancy centers across the country, across the nation across uh, our uh, area in, in the state of North Carolina. These things are amazing. And I talked to Roger this past week. And right now in Ash, we have uh, uh, between 25 and 30 clients. And the, between these clients, they're making 30 to 40 visits uh, every month. They have the Earn While You Learn program, just like we had in Avery. And, and if, you, if some of you were not privy to my past, somehow or another, for about three years, I served as the executive director of a pregnancy center. And I thought, when that happened, I thought, huh? Uh, but I learned that there was a lot of guys involved in this, and I loved it. And I watched God do some miraculous, incredible things. And, and here, even this past week, I got an email from the current director. And the Avery Pregnancy and Resource Center that was founded in 2008, uh, really it started with, with, a, with several people, but, but TC and I were leading it from the beginning. Just found out this last week that they are starting a pregnancy center in Guatemala. And I thought, wow. Uh, because a guy that's working there now, serving on the board, he goes to Guatemala. It's amazing how God works if we'll just get out of the way and let him work. Amen? But, but talking to Roger, 
he said, uh, these 25 to 30 clients, he gave me an example. And, and he called uh, this lady client T. Okay, so we'll call her name T. Today, he said, when I talked to him, he said, today a crisis emerged for this lady named T. She has two children and just had twins in Winston. The father has left her. A friend was caring for the two older children while T is in the hospital. And that day, they were able to meet immediate needs like diapers. And then he said, today another girl married and expecting her third child because she couldn't afford them came and through the Earn While You Learn program was able to get a crib and diapers. There's a lot goes on there. There's hope given at this pregnancy center. That's our part. That's how we can demonstrate. Now, I'm glad to say, in fact, Roger says, please thank the church for their regular support. We are so glad that we can make our plans with the knowledge that Warrensville Baptist Church stands behind us. Now, we give a certain amount. Is it every month or once a year? Is it every month? Monthly, we give. But you know what? Every opportunity we can to support our local pregnancy center, we need to do it. You have clothes that are so good. Don't, don't try to sell them. Go down to the pregnancy center and give them away. You'll be blessed for them. You know, if you're in the store and God puts it on your heart, buy a pack of diapers and just drop them all. They got a carport. Just pour in there and throw it in there. Somebody will get it. Or, you know, and I'm sure we'll do, as a church, we'll do other things. But the point today is this. You have to, you have to decide what your view of life is going to be. And then you have to demonstrate it. I read this morning where a professor at a college, he's a Christian in a secular college. He's very pro-life. And he would go down, and I saw pictures of, uh, he was at a, an abortion clinic. He would go and try and talk to some of these girls. And they had, they had uh, guards that would escort these girls from the car there and all the stuff. Y'all, if y'all know anything about that, y'all know some of that stuff. But he's in danger of losing his job because he's going down there and doing that. He's demonstrating his view of life. So we need to do what God would have us to do. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We're just going to sing a hymn of invitation. Hymn number 285. Our song is, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. And so that's our cry. Listen, if you're here this morning and you've never given your heart to Jesus, it'd be a beautiful day to do it. It's a day of life. And that's eternal life. But even where you're standing in just a moment, listen, if God puts it on your heart, to change the way you think. Maybe God changed your mind this morning. Maybe God uh, just kind of gave you that extra push you needed this morning to change your way of thinking or maybe to just to reiterate, to now to demonstrate your way of thinking, to be pro-life, to stand up to abortion. See, when we ask these girls, young girls, to keep their babies, we got to help them because they seem hopeless we've seen it we've seen a young lady just seem hopeless her life is over but through Jesus he was able to give them hope God I just want to thank you today for life thank you for my life Lord thank you for the lives of the children that we see here for my own children for every child that's here today that's across the street God we, we're so thankful thank you thank you God for this precious life that we God, we love you today, and I just pray, Lord, any decisions that need to be made and that are going to be made, Father, just give them the wisdom, give us the wisdom.